Hi, today we're going to be talking about the chemical basis of life and a brief introduction to different types of chemical bonds and atoms and their properties and why different bonds do form. Most of this lecture, the images that you see in some of the notes are taken from uh, biology by Concepts and Connections by Campbell. So if you have that textbook and access to that website, there's some great tutorials for you. Make sure that you do follow along and give those a chance. So why study chemistry? Right? Why chemistry? I thought we were in biology. And the answer is really that biology is based on chemistry. If we talk about the hierarchy of life and we go down to the simplest level, we remember that it's the molecules and the atoms that make up the organelles, that make up cells, that make up an organism. So we have to talk about the simplest level and how those things interact in order to understand the biology of life. The chemistry can be seen right here in um, the Amazon rainforest. This little ant right here is producing what they call the devil's garden, which is this dense area here of this single type, this monoculture essentially um, type of plant. And the question as to how these little farmers are actually maintaining this plant and reducing its competition with all others is that they're injecting an acid, a type of formic acid, into the other plants. It's a chemical compound, and as a result, those plants don't grow and just the um, ant's desired um, crop is actually growing in here. So understanding the chemistry and how molecules are produced and how they interact really helps us to explain higher level interactions and that's why chemistry and understanding the foundations of chemistry is really essential to a good understanding in biology. So today we're going to talk about elements, atoms, and molecules. Give you a brief refresher on what these things are, their properties, and also how to um, predict how they're going to interact with each other. So some of the foundations here. All living organisms are composed of matter. And matter, remember, is anything that has mass and takes up space. Matter also, recall, matter recycles in an ecosystem. Earth essentially is a closed ecosystem with nothing really new coming in, aside from a few meteors and things like that. But really what we have is what we have. So the carbon, the oxygen, um, all of those elements are constantly being recycled within the Earth. Um, they're changing shape, they're changing form, they're forming bonds, they're breaking bonds, but they're not really destroyed, right? They're constantly being recycled and just produced in a different form. So matter is composed of these chemical elements, and elements are really the simplest form of an atom, right? An element can't be broken down into any simpler. It's still made of smaller particles, but it's the simplest um, piece of that matter that has its properties. And every atom of an element displays the same properties. So a carbon atom is a carbon atom is a carbon atom. There are 92 elements in nature, but most don't exist in a pure form. Most of them are involved in some kind of interaction, and I'll show you why in just a moment. Of these 92, there are 25 that are really required by life. 25 of them are considered essential. The dominant ones are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Two accessories which are also um, important are phosphorus and sulfur. Okay. These elements make up the majority of organic life, and they're, ascent they're really, really important. It's these that are make up, making up our carbohydrates, our proteins, our lipids, our nucleic acids. Others that we require in smaller amounts, like iron or um, iodine, are considered trace elements. Trace elements are important for metabolic function, but we don't need them in as high quantities as we need the others. So here you can see that the majority of human body weight is that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Okay. There's the majority right there, 96%, just over 96%. Those are the really important ones. Phosphorus is really important in ATP, which is energy production. This is the, your cell's currency, your energy currency. Sulfur is also really important um, in proteins. Calcium here and potassium as well as sodium, chlorine, magnesium. These are all essential um, other elements that are really essential for the human body to function well. But you can see they're available in much smaller quantities within the body. So what about those trace elements? We said that we do need them. Yes. Your body needs iron, but it only needs a small amount of iron. Iron is essential. It's the um, element that helps your blood, your red blood cells, carry hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is what transports oxygen, is 
what carries oxygen throughout your body. So you need proper levels of iron for that. Um, you might have heard of someone being anemic, and if you're anemic, you're not, you don't have enough iron, and therefore you're not carrying quite the proper amount of oxygen around your body, and oxygen is going to be really important for cellular respiration. Iodine is another one. Uh, an iodine deficiency leads to a, a condition in the thyroid called goiter, and you can see that in this picture right here. Um, the woman has an enlarged thyroid, and that's because of having an iodine deficiency. Now, where we used to be um, a civilization that incorporated a lot of fish and things like that into our diet, having the proper amount of iodine wasn't a problem. Now, because we have such very different diets than our ancestors, iodine deficiency can be a problem. To compensate for that, a lot of our foods are fortified with chemicals being added to those foods. So iodine, if you've ever had iodized salt, iodine has been added to that salt to help overcome that deficiency. We add chemicals for a variety of different reasons. We, we add them to help preserve it. We add it to make it more nutritious. Most of the cereals you eat, most of the bread you eat, you'll see that they've been fortified. Fortified means that we've added these extra elements in there um, to help supplement the diet. And also to make it look better, okay? Um, especially as Americans, we like our food to look pretty. And so lots of times different chemicals are added to have the fruit or vegetables look a certain way, to preserve them a certain way, things like that. But next time you go and have a snack, take a look at the nutrition facts. Um, for example, here in this total, wow, look at total. Incredibly nutritious, right? 100% of um, vitamin E that you need for the day. 100% of vitamin C, 100% of calcium, 100% of the iron you need in the day. And a lot of this is because it has been fortified. So, back to our elements. A compound is going to be any substance that consists of two or more elements in a combined fixed ratio. So, H2O, water, if we consider that formula, H2O. The two means that we have two hydrogens, and there's no um, there's no subscript following the oxygen, so we can assume that we have one oxygen. So that's a fixed ratio. Every molecule of water has two hydrogens to one oxygen. So anything that has that kind of set ratio is considered a compound. And compounds can do some funny things. So if we consider salt, table salt, N-A-C-L or sodium chloride. Consider the two elements that make it up. Sodium on its own is a soft, solid metal. You can see that here. You're able to slice it with a knife. Chlorine is a poisonous gas. And yet, when you put them together, you get a substance that has very different chemical properties. You get sodium chloride. You get table salt. In sodium chloride, the sodium and the chlorine are in a one-to-one -one ratio. So for every atom of chlorine, we have an atom of sodium to balance it out. And when these two things are mixed, and an ionic compound, as is seen here, the end result is a, is a substance with very different chemical properties. So, as we said earlier, most of the compounds in living organisms contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Those are really important. DNA, for example, it has all four of these elements in it. All four of those elements and you consuming those four elements are necessary for proper functioning of your DNA. This is much the same reason um, why if you're considering an alternative diet such as being a vegetarian, it's really important that you're making sure that your diet is balanced and that you have and you are consuming protein because in protein, we have nitrogen. And nitrogen is going to be essential not only for your body building its own proteins, but also for building DNA. But there are lots of alternative sources of protein. Um, nuts, soy, for example, those are foods that are high in protein. And again, just like sodium chloride, when you put these elements together, you get a product with very different results. So let's look at the atom. This should be a refresher for you. So if you're having some trouble here, make sure you make the time to review this material and check out the resources in your textbook and online. So an atom has three main parts to it. There are lots of subatomic particles. The ones that we are interested in um, for, our, for our biological purposes are proteins, neutrons, sorry, <laughs> protons, neutrons, and electrons. 
So atoms are the smallest piece of any kind of element that display all the properties of that element. And the atoms of an element are all created equal. So a carbon atom is a carbon atom is a carbon atom. Unless we're talking about some isotopes, which we'll get to in a minute. So I've got my three different particles over here. The Inside the nucleus, the center part of the atom, we have our protons, which are sometimes denoted P with a superscript plus, and we have our neutrons. And those are both found within the nucleus. Protons have a plus one charge, and they have a weight of one AMU, one atomic mass unit. Neutrons are neutral, okay? And they also have a weight of one atomic mass unit. So it's really the nucleus of an atom that has the mass of that atom. Electrons are found in orbitals outside of the nucleus. We used to think of it as these really defined rings, and we now know it's more of an electron cloud, as is shown in this other picture here. Okay. And the electron cloud just predicts the probability that an electron is in any given space. Electrons, sometimes denoted E with a superscript negative sign, have a negative one charge. And they have a negligible weight. So we really consider that their mass is zero AMUs. They do have some mass. Um, however, it's so small in comparison to the protons and neutrons that we really don't, um, it doesn't contribute to the atomic mass of the overall atom.